Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. And today we're gonna to be talking about another difference in sexual development. This one is called androgen insensitivity. And an androgen is a hormone that uh, causes a masculine appearance. So testosterone is an example of an androgen. And so we're gonna talk through some cases today about what happens um, when you essentially have a lack of androgen function uh, in an XY fetus. And today can get a little bit complicated uh, because we are going to be dipping our toes a little bit into some hormone activity. And uh, I'm gonna keep it simple today because hormones are a lot to deal with. And um, there's a lot of processing that goes in with hormones. And I have several videos planned down the line to talk more in depth about hormones. So today is going to be a little bit of an oversimplification at some aspects, but I promise I'm going to correct that in later videos and have it be more of a complete picture with regards to hormone activity. But uh, today we're gonna to talk about androgen insensitivity. And there are a couple steps that I need to address in our little pathway in order for this to make sense. Uh, and the first one, so if we know uh, that testosterone and DHT are hormones that need to act on a receptor in order to function, I'm going to add in just a visual reminder that we have our receptors. So I'm going to add in an androgen receptor right above this arrow, since normally we put any components needed uh, for the reaction to happen over this arrow, just as a reminder that we need to have it there. Uh, same thing with DHT down here. We also have to interact with an androgen receptor to get these end results. And androgen insensitivity is not a malfunction in testosterone or DHT. In fact, in these cases, you're going to have a very high level of testosterone and probably also a high level of DHT. And that is because the mutation in this case is in the androgen receptor. And so in a lot of our uh, chemical processes, we have a thing called feedback. And so uh, feedback just means you have a way to monitor the outcome of certain pathways. So uh, if you secrete a hormone A, that's supposed to trigger action B. Uh, if you have not enough action B, your body is going to say, let's make more hormone A so we have a higher chance of having action B take place. And so if our androgen receptor is not working, then uh, we don't have a way for testosterone to work on the target cells. And so the body is going to secrete more testosterone. So we're going to have a very high level of testosterone, but as you'll see in this pathway, it's not going to matter because even though testosterone is functional, it has no place to bind to have its action take place. So let's... go through this pathway um, and I'm going to add more steps, another step later on as well, but we'll get to that in a minute. So we have our person who is XY. So we have our XY. We are assuming that we have a functional SRY gene so we can go on this pathway. We can make TDF. We can make a testis. Our testis is going to make Leydig cells and Sertoli cells, both of which are functional in this case. Leydig cells are going to produce testosterone. Uh, and then testosterone is going to be converted by 5-alpha reductase, which is functional to DHT. But uh, remember, our receptors don't work. So there is no way for testosterone to act on the mesonephric duct, so it cannot stimulate the, the maintenance of the mesonephric duct, so we cannot develop internal male genitalia. I'm going to cross this off. Too. We cannot 
maintain the mesonephric duct. So we're not going to have any internal male genitalia uh, apart from the testis. We still are going to have our testis, but we have no seminal vesicle, no epididymis, no ejaculatory duct, and no ductus deferens. And then looking over here, uh, we have testosterone that is converted by 5-alpha reductase to DHT with no problems there. However, DHT can also not bind to the androgen receptor. So we cannot make any external male genitalia. So you can already see that this is becoming an interesting situation. So we do have a testis, but we do not have uh, and the rest of the internal male tract, and we do not have a penis, scrotum, or prostate. Uh, but we do have functional Sertoli cells, and the Sertoli cells are going to still produce MIF. MIF is present, so we are going to inhibit the paramesonephric duct, so we cannot have internal female genitalia either. So we cannot have fallopian tubes. We cannot have a uterus and we cannot have a proximal vagina. So the next part of this is uh, a step that I have not added to the previous pathways. And that is because um, it touches into hormone activity. And we're going to get into this with the adrenal gland. But testosterone once it builds up, um, it's going to enter an overflow pathway. And so you can think of this kind of like an overflow parking lot, if you will. So if you have an overflow parking lot, if you have too many cars entering one parking lot, uh, there aren't enough parking spaces for every car. And so that's why you're going to have an overflow parking lot where some of these cars uh, can move into and park in that lot so that there isn't an overflow uh, in the original parking lot and everybody can get a parking spot. So this is kind of the same thing with testosterone. If we have an increase in testosterone, we're going to enter this pathway that I have in pink. And this is driven by uh, an uh, enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase is found in adipose tissue, so fat tissue. It is also found in the liver. It's also, I believe, found in the placenta. And it, uh, I think, bone too. There are lots of tissues that produce aromatase. But aromatase is the main enzyme that is responsible for converting testosterone to estrogens. And it's not going to directly become estradiol. It's actually, I believe, going to become estrone first, and then estrone is going to be converted to estradiol. But we'll talk about the different types of estrogen later. But just right now, worry about testosterone, when there is excess, is going to be converted by aromatase to estrogens. So we're now going to have a very high level of estrogens. And I'm going to draw some little arrows here. So we're going to have high testosterone, we're going to have high estrogens. We're still not going to have an ovary because up here in this pathway, we uh, have SRY, so we don't need to enter this pathway. We do have TDF, so we're not going to make an ovary. So no ovary, but we do have a high amount of estradiol because of this aromatase pathway. And so we are going to make external female genitalia. And so this includes a clitoris, a labia, and a distal vagina. So uh, with the distal vagina, since we don't have the ability to make an internal portion of the vagina, uh, it's going to be very shallow and it's not going to lead to a cervix uh, in the way you'd see with a typical female presentation. Um, but also, there is a possibility that you might have ambiguous genitalia because you can have a high amount of testosterone. And so occasionally, you might have, say, a clitoris that looks more like a small penis 
or you might have labia that resembles a small scrotum, but you are still going to have a short vagina. Um, so let's look at the resulting presentation. So our genotype is XY. So this is a typical male genotype. Our internal phenotype. So we have a testis. So we have some internal male genitalia, but not all because we're missing a seminal vesicle, epididymis, ejaculatory duct, and ductus deferens, but we're also missing fallopian tubes, a uterus, and the upper part of the vagina. So we're going to put male question mark uh, because this could be variable. Um, and then the external... is either going to be a typical female presentation where all of these external anatomical structures become very typically female, or it can be ambiguous. And that means that it's somewhere in between male and female. And also something to mention about this is that with the testis, if we have primarily external female genitalia, you are going to probably find these testes sitting inside the labia. So if you imagine um, having typical appearing labia, but with testes inside them because they don't form a scrotum, that is a possibility for what could happen here. Um, so we have a male genotype. We have a kind of male internal phenotype, and we have a very female or ambiguous external phenotype. And so once again, this is a, another very complicated example of why sex isn't binary. Um, this person may look to be female, but in puberty, they are not going to have any uh, male pubertal development. And also, if you were to do an exam on this person, you're not going to find a cervix. And so this is a very complicated situation, but I hope that all of this kind of made sense. And uh, if you have any questions, once again, leave your questions down below, leave any debates down below. And I uh, will do my best to answer all your questions and respond to any debate comments. But in the meantime, I will see you all in the next one.